is uh, Matt Wilson. Uh, he's a, a professor at the Department of Brain and uh, Cognitive Sciences at MIT. Matt studies uh, how animals learn and how they remember what they learn. And uh, today's talk is uh, hippocampal memory, cognition, and the role of sleep. Matt Wilson. Great. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Boris. Well, good to be back here for the uh, uh, for the, the, the summer session here at Woods Hole. Um, so I always like to, uh, you know, give a talk from the perspective of, uh, I'm an engineer, trained as an engineer, uh, from the perspective of an engineer who's trying to understand what the brain can tell us about the fundamental nature of computation underlying human intelligence. Uh, you know, there's going to be an ethics talk later, we'll be talking about, you know, AI. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in uh, sort of you know big data driven uh, you know approaches that you know, transformer models uh, that can kind of emulate intelligence and so there is a question of, you know what what does the brain have left to tell us if we can you know if we can emulate intelligence um, what is it the brain has to tell us and uh, I guess Ed Boyden's going to be giving a talk later and we'll be talking about you know new technologies that give us even greater power to interrogate and understand the nature of underlying brain activity but I, you know, I like to use the, the, the model system that I'll talk about, the, the hippocampus, to try to give some uh, both mechanistic, but also a, uh, kind of a higher level insight to think about what is it the brain does that, um, that kind of challenges the ideas regarding intelligence. And I'll just, I'll just give you the, you know, sort of the, the little spoiler. <laughs> you know, we sort of think about, we sort of think about intelligence as uh, being fundamentally about creating uh, rational systems that can take facts, that can make, you know, appropriate judgments, that, you know, make good decisions, uh, you know, based on all the facts that are, you know, kind of smart. And we sort of think of human intelligence as, you know, being the sort of the biological manifestation of precisely such a computation. Uh, but I think when you really look at human intelligence and you look at the challenges that systems have, you realize that the, the, uh, the approaches that are used to achieve this sort of large scale, massive rational intelligence are not really available to biological organisms. Organisms live in very narrow, in like small niches. They have very limited access to data. Uh, they, you cannot rely on sort of repeating the past because the future is, you know, the, these niches change. Uh, you have to produce adaptive behavior in novel contexts. And that is that you have to do more with less. You have very little data, and yet you have to make decisions that reflect some broader understanding of the world at large, which means you have to make models very quickly. You have to make and draw inferences from the limited data that you have. And so, and you have to do this, you know, quickly and efficiently. And so the idea is that, that the systems that biology has evolved have been systems to do exactly that. Now, the consequence of that, you know, making big decisions, building models on very little data, does not actually lend itself to this, you know, sort of the, uh, uh, a, uh, a rational grounded system. Rather, it leads to systems which are heterogeneous and irrational. And that is that you have many models, individuals, construct their own individual models based upon their limited uh, interrogation of the world. And biological intelligence succeeds not because the individuals are so smart, but largely because the populations as a whole are able to, uh, to solve the problem collectively. And so we have to think of biology not as really smart individuals, but as individuals that are part of a population that as a whole are able to do the best job they, have, they can with the limited data that they have. So that will be the, that will be the challenge. How does biology kind of extract uh, and, uh, data from limited uh, experience in the world and then build models, draw inferences based on that. And so the, the uh, my talk will be in two parts. Uh, the first part I sort of think of as the uh, interrogating the world, as the interaction with the world. This is, uh, this is sort of the wake-sleep model. In the waking state, animals interacting with the world and looking at how the brain represents, processes information during act this, this active state. And then 
There's the offline state, as I like to refer to it. Uh, that would include uh, sleep, but also periods of quiet wakefulness or inattentiveness, uh, where we see the brain switching from a mode uh, uh, rather than taking information from the outside world, is involved in internal processing. So there are these uh, sort of two functions, take in data, then build model and do inference, and then these two states, the wake state, the sleep and quiet wakeful state. And we'll look at the, uh, the sort of the, the, the biology, the nature of brain activity in these two conditions, and then try to, you know, extrapolate their computational function and relevance to this larger, this larger problem of, you know, building models with very little data. So the system that I'm going to be talking about here, this is, uh, this is a, a picture of a rat brain, the overlying neocortex removed, and here you see uh, the hippocampus, which lies in the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, sort of this curved structure, the temporal lobes here on the side, and so if you sort of think of the hippocampus, you just go into the middle of your brain, you've got these two curved structures. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, in cross-section, if you take a slice through the hippocampus, the hippocampus uh, is composed of this very fundamental circuit. Uh, it's an older kind of cortex, and it has a simpler kind of structure, so this archicortical structure, a three-layered uh, structure. It's in which you have uh, a layer of cell body. So here, for instance, if you take these, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the kind of the waypoints in the circuit that starts from the adjacent cortex, the entorhinal cortex, the fibers from the entorhinal cortex come into the hippocampus and go through this so-called trisynaptic loop. They make three hops through the three, these three primary subregions or subfields of the hippocampus. The dentate gyrus, and then cells in the dentate gyrus and absent cells in area CA3, cornua manus 3, from CA3 to CA1, CA1 to the subiculum and out. So it's the, if you, if you want to count the three synapses, there's one, two, three, and then out. CA1 has a direct output, but the subiculum also has, is a, is a primary output structure. Uh, you might notice that uh, I don't know what's you know what's up with these biologists. They uh, you know they didn't take uh, like you know sort of uh, first grade <coughs> you know, arithmetic. They go from one to three. What happened to CA two? CA two uh, is indeed a structure. In fact, there's also CA four. These are sort of in, these kind of intermediate in the rodent. They're smaller, less you know less obvious, uh, less prominent structures. Uh, one interesting thing about CA two. Is CA2 is similar to CA3 in terms of its architecture. It, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit different in that it doesn't actually, it, it doesn't enjoy the kind of direct connectivity with the dentate gyrus, but it does have one of the sort of the, the kind of the signature hallmark properties of the CA3 region, which is strong recurrent connectivity. A lot of it's like a very dense associative uh, network. The other interesting thing about CA2, uh, which doesn't lend itself to a rodent talk, but would lend itself to a human talk. CA2 is the one subfield of the hippocampus that has evolutionarily uh, uh, expanded the most. So in humans, CA2 is, is enormous. So you have a massive CA2 in rodents, you have a very small CA2. So you can kind of ask the question, what is it that, you know, the hippocampus itself and the overall architecture has not really changed evolutionarily. Uh, it's just that some of the circuits have changed, and so you kind of think, well, what is it that CA2 does that uh, that might be particular to the kind of conditions, information, or processing that uh, are unique to humans? And uh, so we can kind of we can come back to that, <clears throat> but that's because I won't have any CA2 data here. So we're just going to have to focus on you know uh, on what we have, and that is so this circuit CA3 to CA1. Now, so CA1. Uh, is interesting in that if you look at the cells, the neurons in CA3 and CA1, they're, they're almost identical. They look very similar, the individual cells. The real difference is the connectivity. CA3 has strong recurrent connectivity, and CA1 has almost none. So CA1 is like a feed-forward network. So you have CA3 is a classical recurrent associative network, CA1 as a feed-forward network, and <coughs> Uh, in the early 1970s, John O'Keefe, 
who was uh, a behavioral electrophysiologist, placed electrodes into CA1, recording the activity, and of course you're probably familiar with the fact because he won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Uh, he discovered that individual neurons, when you take animals and you allow them to explore space, these individual neurons express spatial receptive fields as they fired at certain locations. Uh, you know, the, the story, I always like to sort of tell the story uh, as both kind of a sort of the history of science, but also a way of thinking about and approaching science. So people have been studying the hippocampus for, you know, decades prior to uh, O'Keeffe's electrophysiological studies, behavioral electrophysiological studies, in, you know, lar in large part because of its interest in, in the field of memory and human memory. Of course, you're also familiar with the, case, the, the seminal case of the patient HM who underwent a surgical procedure involving the bilateral resection of the medial temporal lobes, cut out his parts, portions of, uh, went in, kind of cut out portions of the hippocampus and the adjacent entorhinal cortex to treat an intractable epilepsy, and following that, lost the ability to form any new episodic or autobiographical memories. So here was, you know, a part of the brain that was specifically and perhaps uniquely involved in the formation of autobiographical memory, which was contrary to a lot of theories of brain function up to that point, which sort of posited the brain as kind of, uh, you know, the, like the holographic theory, theories of mass action, the idea that the, the brain is a distributed memory system, that there's no one, and there's no specialization, it's just the brain does processing. Uh, uh, probably most sort of famous, famously advocated uh, by Carl Ashley, who did, you know, these sort of very important experiments in which he went in and just kind of scooped out different area locations in the brain and different amounts of brain and then looked at the impact of behavior and his conclusion was you know, the more brain you scoop out the more the greater the impact of behavior and it doesn't make any difference what part of the brain so you scoop out any parts of the brain it's just it's it's the it's the quantity of brain that matters so this was really <laughs> uh, uh, very contrary to that notion, and drew a lot of attention to the hippocampus, since there was a lot of work, electrophysiological work, people using rodent models, putting in electrodes. Uh, and a lot of these models use classical learning, you know, theory approaches, classical conditioning. Uh, but all of them had one thing in common: for you know, experimental uh, necessity and expediency, they involved head fixing the animal. And why do you have to do that? If you put electrodes put little tiny electrodes, electrodes that are small enough to record from individual neurons, then, you know, the sort of the tolerances in that recording are very, uh, are, you know, very small. So you have to be within tens of microns of cells, can't really tolerate a lot of movement, you know, instability, so everything needs to be fixed or secured. So all the experiments at that point had been done with head-fixed animals. Uh, now what O'Keefe did was say, you know, is a kind of a behavioral, I mean, a sort of a behavioral psychologist, but also electrophysiologist, to really understand what the brain does, you know, in natural conditions, you really, really need to study it in freely behaving animals. So he devised the methods that allowed for fine wire electrodes to be placed in the animal, at, you know, with a, with a tether, allowing the animal to move around. And that's sort of the simple, that sort of simple step of allowing animals to do what they naturally do revealed this fundamental property of hippocampal coding. And it really sort of changed the overall view of the hippocampus. Uh, you know, in part because it revealed this novel correlate, the spatial correlate, but it also fit with a larger sort of uh, uh, kind of theory or approach to the study of, uh, you know, cognition and intelligence. And that is the, this is the contrast between the so-called the, the behaviorist theory of, you know, of learning and cognition. And that is <coughs> the, uh, the idea that you know, all learning is, is just kind of a, is based on simple principles of associative learning, stimulus, response, reward. And so that is, if you just like pair a stimulus with a response and you reward it, you reinforce that. It's kind of like you know, the, the heavy and the sort of, you know, the heavy and synapse is, a, is a, a, you know, a synaptic version of that rule. It's like reinforcement learning. And the, you know, the argument was, well, that's how we learn everything. So everything is learned, it's all acquired, and it's all tied to, you know, to associative, reinforced associative learning. But there was another school of thought that, said, you know, that, that posited that, that actually learning is, you know, we don't learn everything, that we actually know a lot before we learn, and that was we start with internal models, and we use our interactions with the world 
to both to both test but also modify that in those models. And that is that they're sort of their internal cognitive models. This is the sort of the you know the cognitive approach, uh, and uh, the demonstrations of that. One of the, you know, sort of a classical demonstration of that was the phenomenon known as latent learning. Latent learning was, uh, you know, sort of classic behavioral theory. You take an animal, you put it in a box, you know, you, you know, you flash a light, you give it some food, to, you know, to go to a certain location. It'll learn to repeat that. And so animals learn what they experience. Uh, in latent learning, if you take two animals, you put one in a box, and you just let it wander around, you, you know, it doesn't do anything. The other animal you leave in the cage, and then the next day you come out and you train both of them. So now they're going to learn a task, but in one case the animal has had passive or latent exposure to the environment. In the other case it is not. And it turns out the animals that had latent exposure to the environment learn better. So they learned something by just exploring the space. There was no reward, they weren't, you know, they weren't learning any particular behavior. And so this idea that there was latent learning building a based on a cognitive model, and then O'Keeffe's discovery of place cells, and this fit into this notion that the hippocampus, yes, question, is that, was the question, what do you mean by latent learning? Exactly, no external reward. So it's essentially learning without reward. That was the, you know, that was sort of the challenge to the behaviorist theory. And so the idea is, look, I'm wandering around here doing things, I'm not learning anything until I get reward. If I get rewarded for something, then I increase the frequency of that behavior. And behaviors that don't get rewarded are decreased in frequency. And so this is the idea, that's how we learn. We just do things, we're like sheep that, you know, sort of, you know, follow the, you know, the, the brightest light, the, you know, the sweetest, you know, uh, you know, reward. That that's how, that that's how behavior is driven. As opposed to whatever we do, you know, we're constantly learning we're learning by uh, sort of, again, testing, informing, and refining internal models. But what are those internal models? And one of those models that O'Keefe, uh, in a, you know, along with, uh, with Lynn Nadell, in a very influential book, The Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map, the idea is that, that we learn on a foundation of spatial representation or maps. And that is, we have maps of the world, and then we learn things on top of that. But the map essentially is, you know, it's there. We can refine it. We can kind of, you know, kind of tweak it. Uh, but the, the substrates for formation of maps is there. And here comes the hippocampus. There are these recordings, and you have these cells that look like they, you know, encode spatial locations. Now, I always like to point out, you know, encoding is like gets tossed around. It's like it's sort of a little computational buzzword. Oh, you know, neural codes for this, codes for that. You know, codes are something, you know, we can also talk about representations. Codes have a very particular, you know, meaning and requirement. And that is sort of codes are, sp are directed transformations that are intended to communicate informa information to a receiver. And that is that a code is only meaningful if it gets decoded by someone. Simply transforming information does not mean it's a code. And so the challenge for the hippocampus is both to point out, A, is there a spatial representation? Is there a transformation into the spatial domain? Well, you think about that, oh look, I see like place cells. Isn't that the spit, you know, is, there's, that's, that's like a, it looks like a transformation. Well, it could be if the spatial information wasn't already there in the input. If it's already there in the input, it's not being transformed. Uh, and if it's not being transformed, then you have to ask the question, well, you know, What's the, you know, what, what, what would be the coding imperative if you already had the information input? So uh, to understand the nature of the hippocampal code, you kind of want to know what's going on on the input, the entorhinal cortex. And so this is where the companion prize, the Nobel Prize that John O'Keefe received for the discovery of play cells, was given to uh, Edvard and Maybrit Moser, who discovered for the discovery of so-called grid cells in the entorhinal cortex, and that is a representation of what appeared to be a largely kind of Euclidean, even like Cartesian-like, grid-like, regular grid-like structure in which sort of metric distance information was represented, and then these grids were conveyed into the hippocampus. And so the hippocampus, as we'll see, forming representations of places in space. And so we can again think about the difference between a location in space, a spatial representation, like a map, 
and then a place representation in the hippocampus. Now those two things are obviously going to be related. We think about you know this, this room as enjoying both a uh, a, a place representation and a spatial representation. You can think about the spatial representation, it's like the geometry, the coordinate system, you know, where is this located on a, if I took up, pulled out a map of MBL, where is it located? But the place representation, so place is, uh, you can think of this as being the combination of location and context. Now what is context? Context is sort of this nebulous, this sort of nebulous term. It's the thing that makes this the experiences that occur in a particular space uh, unique and memorable. And so you've been in this location, you've been sitting probably, as I always like to point out whenever I you know, teach classes on this, uh, like in the first class, the one thing I tell the students, you know one thing I'm pretty sure is gonna happen the next time we have this class is that everybody's gonna come back and they're gonna sit in exactly the same place. You probably come back and you sit in the same locations. There's sort of a tendency to, you know, I don't know, you just feel more comfortable. Well, and it, yes, question. So, so this is the, if you change your place, you know, the location. So let's say you come in and you move to another location in this room. The, the cells that carry that information, I'll say encode that information, will be different. And that is that by looking at the hippocampus, I'll be able to tell that you actually moved to a different location. Great question, exactly. So there was a lot of work, you know, sort of, you know, after the discovery of place cells, there was a lot of work trying to understand exactly what, you know, what control place cells. And the obvious thing would be, well, it's like the cues. It's, you know, you come in, you see certain things, it's the configuration of cues, and there's a distinction between uh, referred to as local, or proximal, and distal cues. Distal cues would be things like, you know, off in the distance, if you're out, you can think of buildings, landmarks. Proximal cues would be exactly this, things like, you know, chairs, the, you know, the design on the, you know, on the flooring, and uh, manipulations of those two cues demonstrated that they both have, like, different impact on this, like, on the spatial coding. I don't want to go into too much detail on that, but uh, uh, you can think of there being sort of two properties of a map. One is, like, the actual layout, the, you know, sort of the geometry, the metrics. Then the other, of course, is, like, the orientation. And as you have to, you know, you have to orient a map in order for it to be useful. And while proximal cues had a lot of impact on, you know, exactly what the distribution of cells would be, and you could, like, by shifting cues, you could kind of distort the, the distribution of, of the fields, the distal cues would have great impact on the orientation of the map. And that is, you used it to align the so-called directional system. So there are cells that carry information, compass head directional information. And those are combined with this spatial geometry to give you the layout. But the larger question is this notion of place. So what does it mean, place, what is context? And you know, some interesting experiments. So you can take the same cells, bring the animal, bring, you know, you come in, you know, today, you come back tomorrow morning, record the cells. And large body, body of work, uh, you know, pointed to the stability of these place cells. Same cells fire, same location, the map is preserved with repeated exposure. Uh, but there are other things that could change or so or so-called remap those cells. You come back into the same space, but I change some condition. Now what would that condition be that I changed? So for instance, I could change the time of day. Let's say you come in here in the morning, you have lectures, and then you come in in the evening. Same space, <laughs> but you know, sort of different talks. Maybe it's different topics, maybe it's like another course. And what you find is that that is sufficient to induce remapping, a different set of cells. And so you can ask the question, what, you know, how can you have a different place in the same space? Time of day, that can be a, that can be a, you know, a sort of a determining factor. It could be the content. Let's say you have, uh, you know, instead of me up here talking, you know, you're gonna have Ed Boyden up here, he's gonna be talking. And the question would be, are you going to have the same cells, the same hippocampal place cells going to be active in the same way for a slight difference, slight change in the cue? That is just the one, you know, just one person. Everything else is the same, one person. And so this idea that you need to, that you need to have unique, these maps that are associated with context, but context is not something that you can, you know, you can tie to any one property. It's not like, oh, it's like, 
if you know the color changes, then we change the context. It's anything that might be relevant that might require some kind of novel encoding. If I if I have new information, I need a new you know I need a new map, and so that we can call context. And so this circuit, and there was a lot of work and a lot of interest in developing computational models that that tried to confer the properties of these circuits, or these, these computational functions onto the properties of these circuits. And so this idea of making very small, change, very small changes in the input leading to very large changes in the output. as like a different map for like you know, morning and evening, one speaker versus the other. Uh, and the idea is that was like separating patterns, small change in input, large changes in the output. Uh, and that was a function that was ascribed to the dentate gyrus. Now, on the other hand, as you point out, okay, you come in here, you know, sometimes maybe some people are different, sometimes you have a coffee cup, there are lots of changes, many changes to, uh, you know, in the context that are not relevant, that don't indicate that, they, you know, that, uh, you know, a sort of new representation needs to be formed. And so in that case, you need to be resistant to changes, large changes in the input leading to no changes in the output, small change output. And that's the so-called pattern completion. And so this pattern separation function, I, you know, and maybe after we can sort of talk about what the, you know, all the properties of these circuits, dentate gyrus, that, that were argued to confer this property. And then CA3, with largely the recurrent associative connectivity, giving this pattern completion-like function. And so that was like, let's say, okay, pattern separation, pattern completion. This is like getting the context right. So it's like, okay, I got to set up, it's like, you know, it's like pulling out the right notebook if you're taking notes. It's like, you know, I gotta, if I'm taking notes, I gotta have the right notebook to write my stuff down, right? I don't wanna write, pull out the notebook for, you know, the evening lecture and start taking notes that everything gets scrambled up. So it's a way of establishing these uh, sort of buckets for encoding information. Now, while you're in that context, that's just the starting point. So you can kind of think about that, oh, like that's, you know, that was the, you know, that was the big problem. It's storage and retrieval, pattern encoding, representation, storage and retrieval. And a lot of work in associative memories focus on exactly that. How do you use these circuits to encode and retrieve information? They talk about capacity, fidelity, all these things. But when, again, when you really think about it, what is the information that you're putting into these notebooks? That just kind of ensured that you've got the right context, you pulled out the right notebook. What you actually put into those notebooks are, it's the time series of events, the experiences that occur within that context. And so you have to have these two functions available to you. The ability to have a stable notebook, a context, a representation, a framework on which you can encode information, but then you have to have the ability to encode time sequence information so-called episodic information uh, in a, uh, an instant unique way. And that is it's like one trial learning, episodic memory is you, you know, you're able to encode one shot memories, things that occur exactly once. And so we'll see how the hippocampus you know, tries to achieve that. Spatial representations, contextual dependence on, you know, this, of place, and then the ability to encode time sequence information using the dynamics of the hippocampus. Yeah, follow-up question or no? Yeah, great question, right. So this question, you know, what, you know, <laughs> you know, what triggers remapping? A lot of people have studied this. I just had a you know, postdoc who sort of you know, recently published a you know, paper on this, uh, uh, you know, sort of taking a Bayesian inference framework, and that is that, you know, that you're trying to do inference that you, don't, you never really, you don't know, right? Is this a different context? Is it not? Is this change important? Is it not? And so you know, as you accumulate you know, evidence that, in fact, the information that you're, that you're getting actually forms more than one, it doesn't fit well into one distribution. So you need to have like, you know, multiple distributions. And so at that point, when you decide, you know, I need a new map, that's the, the, the trigger. And there's no one, you know, there's, uh, there's no one rule, but it, it, the idea is that it depends on your experience. The more experience you have, the more evidence that, you know, it really does seem like you know, I come here in the morning, I come here in the evening, and you know, the, the, the talks, they seem different. They really don't seem, I can't really lump them together. And so as you gain more experience, you decide, actually, these are like two, you know, I thought these were just, the, you know, a one lecture series, it's actually two lecture series, I'm gonna split those. And so at that point, you actually get the split. So this is what you find, that 
that when you, you know, if you add, put an animal into an environment with uncertainty, as that uncertainty is resolved, there can be triggers that will lead to precisely that, this sort of precipitous, you know, a, a kind of sudden remapping. Uh, so there's also, um, you can you describe, you know, mapping. There's like a sort of a total remapping, so-called global remapping. Global remapping is like complete reconfiguration of the place cells and the spatial representation. Uh, and then there's what's referred to as rate remapping, and that is that the cells fire in the same location, but the firing rates vary. And so you can kind of think about this as like, you know, sort of in a vector space, global remapping is like completely changing the, you know, the angle of the, you know, that vector. Rate remapping would be sort of changing the length or, you know, slightly the, you know, the angle in, you know, you know in one space. Uh, and then the other is partial remapping, which is sort of what you're referring to. And that is, you don't have to change everything. Or in the case of rate remapping, you don't really change, you know, you don't change anything. You just sort of change the, uh, like, kind of scalar properties of the vector. Partial remapping, you can think of decomposing this larger vector space into smaller subspaces. And so you can change some parts, but not other parts. And what this, what this suggests is that the overall re, you know, representation is not like one monolithic representation, one map. You can think of it as being composed of smaller submaps, this, this compositional notion. And so the question, is there a logic to the way in which you might want to break down a map? How do you break it down? You know, if you're in a conventional map, I mean, you break it down and it's like a geometric or kind of a spatial breakdown, right? I have maps of adjacent locations. And largely, the breakdown of those, you know, you know how I, uh, you know, decompose that, is based on the uh, the relative independence of the information within each of those maps. And so, there are going to be things that are going to be, you know, that are going to be sort of sufficiently described within that individual map, and then there are going to be transitions or interactions between these maps, which could be interchangeable. So maybe I go from this room to you know, there might be, you know, five other rooms. And so, uh, you know, I might want to be able to kind of swap in, swap parts of the map in and out. And so this idea that there can be generalization, this is one way of thinking about it, generalization is sort of taking the rules and representations from one experience and then translating them into another. The idea that there's some equivalence, even though the context seems to change, seems to have changed, there's still stuff that I can use from prior experience. So all of these ideas, the ideas of remapping, global rate remapping, partial remapping, the idea of potentially compositional representations that might reflect the use of these you know, cognitive maps to serve a larger function. And the larger function that I would argue the system is trying to, and the hippocampus is contributing to, is essentially kind of building <clears throat> building a generalizable model of the world. That's what animals are trying to do. Limited data, I need to build a model of the world. Once I have a model, then I can use that model, in, you know, in like an, in a generative, uh, uh, you know, fashion to both predict and direct behavior, even though things change. That is, it's going to be, you know, the model's going to work even if there are, uh, uh, you know, minor changes to the context. And so that's what animals, you could say, are trying to do. And then the question is, how are they actually doing that? And how is that reflected in the, uh, in the activity of the hippocampus? So any other questions? But that's sort of the big, that's sort of the top-down view. So we had definitely spatial navigational deficits. Uh, uh, you know, sort of part of the uncertainty as to, you know, what that told us about the hippocampus is that the, the lesions also included the adjacent entorhinal cortex. So the entorhinal cortex, you can think of as if it was critical for providing the spatial information to the hippocampus, that could make it difficult to form maps. Uh, uh, but there was, there was a lot of work, you know, a lot of arguments about uh, sort of the necessity of the hippocampus in navigation, because HM, highly intelligent, was able to function, you carry on a conversation. So, you know, all his other cognitive capacities seemed to be intact. It was simply this loss of the ability to, you know, form uh, kind of short-term anterior grade new memories. And then there was also this loss in, limited loss in retrograde memory. And that is sort of for relatively recent 
like, well, in the case of HM and in humans, it could be years past, uh, but couldn't remember what he did, you know, yesterday or last week. But if you asked questions about did he remember things about his childhood, he could relate, he could, you know, sort of tell you things that he remembered from his childhood. So this, this sort of gave rise to this idea, it's like this sort of, you know, dual memory system, the idea that we have uh, a you know, system for forming short-term memories, and then those shorter-term memories get consolidated into longer-term memories, and that the locus of those two memories is different. Hippocampus is the site where you form you know, short-term or immediate memories, and then those get you know, translated and transferred into other parts of the brain, let's say into the neocortex. And so there was this idea that you have you know, memories being you know, slowly, gradually shifted to other, uh, you know, parts of the brain. And this was one of the models for sleep. Sleep was, okay, sleep is the time that you transfer memories from the hippocampus to the neocortex. And we can kind of talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I always like to sort of point that out. I think it's really, I think it's really sort of an important, uh, uh, you know, uh, observation and insight. And that is the damage to systems that are involved in forming memories of the past also impact our ability to imagine the future. And so it's this idea that, you know, imagining the future involves a generative process that relies on this memory system. So uh, what is it about the hippocampus that would tie like past and future? And so that's kind of the segue into the sort of the talk about the electrophysio, what actually goes on in the hippocampus. And what we'll see is that while that initial observation of place cells and, you know, spatial representation of the hippocampus was correct, there was a follow-up observation, also made by John O'Keefe in the early 1990s, that involved the encoding of temporal order information. And so what he observed was that place cells didn't just fire when the animal's at a location, that the timing of cells uh, with respect to uh, an internal oscillation, the theta oscillation, carried temporal order information. And so when you look at, when you decode the full population, what you see is the hippocampus is actually, it, you know, uh, you know, every, you know, 100 milliseconds or so, 10 times a second, it's repeatedly representing and reflecting uh, your experience going from the immediate past to the immediate future. And that is a sort of tying past, present, and future together. And so you're doing this constantly. You're, you know, you're remembering what I just did, <laughs> you know, tying that to where I am now. And then you can say imagining or, you know, projecting, predicting what the future state is going to be. So the hippocampus, by its nature, is constantly tying together in this temporal domain, past, present, and future. Now, the question, okay, how do you take that limited, very limited, and that, you know, the time scale of that, you know, kind of past, present, future uh, uh, extrapolation is on the order of a few seconds of, you could say, like the kind of cognitive behavioral time. You're imagining, or, you know, you're remembering where I was a few seconds ago, Imagine where I'll be a few seconds from now. That's not an absolute time frame, but it's, you know, it's still, it's relatively fixed. So thinking about, well, how would you go beyond that? And so that's where we can kind of bring in some of these other mechanisms that suggest, well, the hippocamp is able to, in fact, take, you know, information about time-ordered events and then use them to both, you know, sort of recall things in the past, but also project, you know, forward into the future using some of the properties that I'll, I'll point out. One is this encoding, uh, kind of time sequence encoding using the dynamics of brain oscillations, and then the use of these different brain states, in particular the quiet wakeful state, to kind of express these discrete state transitions that uh, would have the ability to kind of transcend the real time constraints of just a few seconds. So you could like imagine, link together events. I could think, oh, I'm here, I could, you know, get to my car, and then I could get to Boston. So from here, I can imagine getting from here to Boston in like three steps. And so that would be the kind of, you know, sort of temporal, you know, order linkage that would be possible given the properties of the hippocampus. Uh, so, you know, this happens pretty frequently. I think I actually, let's say I got to slide one, which is sometimes more than I, you know, I get to to kind of get just to the intro, to kind of introduce the basic topic. And we'll take a break, you know, at 10.30, so. Uh, but the first half of the, <laughs> the talk really was 
to try to fill in a lot of the details of what I just went through, right? And so this idea of the hippocampus involved in memory, and then the observation of spatial encoding, the link between spatial memory and you know episodic memory. It's not an obvious link if you think about why would you know damage the hippocampus? Why would it impact these two? And it does impact this even in HM and in humans. It was definitely a spatial navigational deficit. You know, you show him how to get to the bathroom. You come back ten minutes later, he will not be able to get to the bathroom. Right? He just can't. You know, would not be able to do that simple sort of function. Uh, and then the argument is that they sort of one critical you know feature of these two forms of memory is that they involve encoding of, of sort of temporal order, or temporal sequence information. You have to remember events in the order in which they occurred. In one you know, and you know that's sort of fundamentally important. You think about it generally because sort of time order from time order, and this is my sort of you know uh, you know what, why, and how model of you know of uh, sort of cognitive function. The three step so the three step program to intelligence. The first thing you have to do is like the encoding step, like what happened? In your you know, evaluation of the world, you have to take in information, you have to know what actually happened. Uh, <clears throat> but you also then, from that, you know, that experience, you have to try to infer why things happen, as you have to infer causality. And inferring causality requires that you get the order right. And uh, once you get the order right, once you've, once you've identified the causal agents, what are the critical things A actually causes B? I mean, there's a lot of stuff out here most of it is irrelevant. Some things are relevant because you know, they have predictive power. Now I can, you know, with this refined model, I can invert that and use this in a generative way to determine how I want to see it. So now if I specify an objective, I can use the model to figure out how I would achieve that objective. So there's the what first, and that's where the encoding comes in. So the first thing I have to do is I've taken information and I have to preserve temporal order. Otherwise, I can't do the next step, the causal inference step, right? Uh, and so the approach is going to be simple. We're going to take, you know, this is O'Keefe, you know, uh, you know, used a variant of this, putting in little fine wire microelectrodes into the brain. The, the shafts are insulated, the tips are exposed, allowing you to pick up electric fields generated by nearby neurons. And just sort of given the size and the geometry of these electrodes, so-called tetrodes, because they have four channels, uh, you're able to pick up the uh, electrical discharges or spiking activity from very small dipoles that are generated here. For small dipoles, you have to be like really close to cells, so you can get really close to cells. What this means is you can see the discharges, the electrical discharges from a bunch of cells in the proximity of this. The tetrageometry means you can resolve the spatial location, which means you can pull out individual sources distributed around this. So you can get lots of cells from a single four-channel electrode. You put in a bunch of those electrodes into a little array. You put the array on the animal's head. You stick this, you know, the, you know, you uh, put the, you know, the tetros down into the hippocampus and into one of the properties of the hippocampus I mentioned. This is this older, simpler architecture, archaecortical structure where you have a primary cell, one primary cell layer where all the cells are packed in. And so that's great. It means it looks like, hey, all the cells are there. So if I put the electrodes down where all the cells are, I'm going to get good recordings. Other parts of the brain, cells are a little bit more distributed, so it's harder to you know, take advantage of that because, again, the electrodes are really just going to pick up stuff that's near the electrodes. So if you, you know, the, the density and distribution of cells differs. It's not going to be as effective. Uh, also, the nature of electrophysiology requires that sort of dipoles be oriented in a particular way, which means if you have good layered structures, it's, easy to, it's easier to pick up, to position the electrodes to pick up the spiking from lots of cells. If the cells are oriented in different ways, like in, as in the nuclear structures, it can be harder. So in a sense, the hippocampus is the ideal structure to get lots of cells. <laughs> and, uh, and so when you do this, this is just an illustration of actual data. Each point here is, a, is an action potential where it's just where the axes here are the amplitude, the peak amplitude of a spike. Here it's four channels, so it's four dimensions. You're just seeing two of those dimensions, so you pick two channels. And you know, the nature of the electric fields produced by these things is that you know, bigger fields, closer the cell is, bigger the, the field is, so stronger the field. And so when you see, for instance, here, a bunch of points, which means a bunch of spikes that have a large amplitude on channel one and a small amplitude on channel two, that means the cell is like close to channel one and far from channel two. 
And so different cells are gonna have different amplitude profiles, and of course this is in four dimensions. So if you do this, you know, you pull out a dozen, few dozen cells from each electrode, you put in a dozen, 20, you know, 30 electrodes, you can get a few hundred cells. And so, you know, back in the day, and Ed, of course, is gonna be talking about new technologies, and a lot of people, including our lab, is you know, using new technologies for doing large-scale imaging, which is great, I mean, this really is the future. Uh, but the one thing that the electrophysiology, <laughs> you know, the use of wires affords is that it's actually looking at one thing. It's looking at the electric field generated by electric currents <laughs> that are the result of the opening and closing of particular channels. So you're looking specifically at electrical activity. And, uh, you know, unlike other methods where you have to divine, you know, sort of sensors, devise and divine sensors that will report different states of the cell, you know, and the most popular of which are these kind of secondary, you know, indicators of activity like calcium, which are not directly reflecting, you don't see actual spikes, you see the consequence of that. And so this remains the most direct way of looking at the actual spiking activity until, and Ed will be talking about the new generation of, you know, sort of voltage sensors, genetically coded you know, voltage indicators, voltage sensors that could provide the same kind of, you know, uh, the, the, the same signature of electrical activity. Um, and so that certainly in the, is the future, but armed with just this basic, what I call garage neuroscience, because you could literally go into your garage if you have the right wires, you could make these things, you could make these devices, and you could do this at home, because this doesn't require, you know, doesn't require a cyclotron, doesn't wire, you know, doesn't require a 7T magnet, it's just, you need some wires, you need steady hands, and, um, and once you do that, you see, you can kind of see this activity. And one nice thing about this approach, these wires, you know, once you put them in, because they're flexible wires, they remain relatively stable over time, days, weeks, months. So you can carry out chronic long-term recordings with electrodes in animals that are moving freely, just as O'Keefe had done uh, in those seminal experiments in the early 1970s. And so when you do that here, this is just an illustration of the property of the phenomenon of place cells. This is just showing each individual point here is an action potential, a spike. They're color-coded, sort of based on this you know, color coding. And so the idea is that when you see spike amplitude distributions like this, you can go in and, in this case, sort of manually identify regions or clusters, which would, uh, uh, which would sort of identify these things as units. I'm careful not to refer to them as cells because you don't really know they're cells. It just says these spikes seem to have come from, like, a, a, you know, a location, a fixed location in space, right? They came from a particular region. The amplitude profile reflects the the, you know, the relative distance from those electrodes. But you see there are sort of variations in that amplitude, and that's because the spike amplitudes themselves can vary. There was a question? Question, no question? No, okay. Uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, these could be, you could say, well, you know, units, well, what else could they be if they weren't, if they weren't cells, if they weren't actual neurons, right? And aren't neurons the only those are the only units there are, right? The little ball, and, you know. Well, yes and no. <laughs> and so, uh, like many of this, you know, the neurons in the brain, uh, while we kind of think of action potentials and spiking activity as coming from the cell bodies or the, you know, the initial segments going out to axons, the dendrites or the receiving structures are also capable of producing action potentials. And so you can get spikes that are generated in the cell bodies that you don't see in the dendrites spikes that you see in the, de the generating dendrites that you don't see here. So really, you know, the cell itself is kind of a more complex computational unit. And this, you know, you'll be able to see that. And as you can have spikes here that, are ge that might be generated at different points, but that's not because they come from different cells, they just come from different parts of the cell. And that, the, you know, one, one way in which you would see that would be for instance, here, this sort of change in amplitude come, could come from actual change of the amplitude of the spikes, or a shift in the location, that action potential is actually generated from different locations. Oh, this is like a change in the relative location. Uh, and so all of that is actually going on. You're seeing that, you can see both dendritic and somatic action potentials here. 
amplitude. So this is like the actual amplitude, like the points here, you just, you're recording, the electric fields is just the voltage, the local voltages. When, you, when the voltage reaches the peak, you pull that point off and you drop it on here. So channel one, this would be the voltage on, you know, on, you know one channel, voltage on channel two, and so it's just the relative channel one, channel two. That's what you're looking at here. And so different, you know, cells generating action potential will produce different profiles, you know, big here, maybe small here, and it's that profile that's giving you this clustering of points. So you break down these clusters, you color code them, and when you do that, you get something that looks like this. And this is something that was tested on a, on a so-called linear maze. So the animal in this case is running in two directions. It gets a food reward at each end, it runs here, and it alternates going back and forth like this. And what you see when, when you constrain the animal's trajectory or path in space to follow these sort of repeated, these, you know, uh, these repeated sequences, uh, and that is that the cells now are not simply uh, you know, reflecting the location on the maze, but also the direction. They acquire what's, what's referred to as directionality. So this yellow cell, for instance, will fire as the animal runs through here. You get this, each one of these spikes, this is now accumulated over like 10 minutes. So this is like the average activity. But in each and every pass, when the animal goes through here, you'll get this like pop, 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 and then it'll go through and then the animal comes through. Now when the animal goes back in this direction, you don't get the same response. Now the, you know, so the cartoon version is it only fires in this direction, pop, 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 and then it doesn't fire this in, direct, in this direction. In reality, you sort of get a difference. There's a, like a different firing rate, higher, you know, much stronger response in one direction than the other. Great question. So this is, can you get place fields without reward? That was the fundamental premise of the latent learning experiments. You put an animal in a box, no reward, and they learn something. You put an animal in a box with no reward and you get place fields. Place fields form. And so they form very rapidly within like, you know, just a few, you know, a few passes, like one pass through a location is enough to lead to the expression of a place field that then over, you know, a period of, you know, sort of repeated passes, seconds to minutes will get stronger. But nonetheless, the map itself is established like one shot. That's the idea. No reward. What does reward do? There have been a lot of experiments, recent experiments, some older experiments that suggest that reward, <coughs> it's like a gain factor. So it can increase the density and firing rate of cells. You get more cells around locations of, a, of reward and that the firing rate of those cells is modulated. So you get a stronger response at reward location. You over-represent reward locations, but you don't need it to, you know, to form place cells. So it points out two things. One is there's just like this, again, this kind of the spatial layout, but then there's the stuff that happens in space. And so in this case, the stuff that happens in space is like moving in a particular direction. And so when the animal you know, runs in this direction versus this direction, now you say, that's actually like, do I need a different code for the two directions? Because different things might happen. This direction might be different might be sort of functionally or behaviorally, you know, distinct in that, that I might have to do different things in this direction versus that direction. So that was the idea of context. So in this case, you could say direction of movement serves as like a sort of a contextual signal for remapping. The cell now doesn't just fire at this location, only fires at this location and this direction. Uh, yes, question. It's the, it was, is a question that had been raised early on. You think, oh, this directionality, maybe it's just because of differences in cues, right? The animal's pointing in this direction, sees one thing, and that actually was sort of an early theory, this the so-called local view theory. And the idea was, yeah, this, the directionality is because in this direction you're seeing one set of cues, this direction you're seeing another set of cues, and there was the idea that place cells form based on the configuration of cues, right? It's like an associative learning thing. So, I have a cell here that's only going to fire when I see, you know, that pillar and that speaker in a particular, right, with a sort of a particular geometric arrangement. So it becomes dependent on cues and the arrangement of cues and the, you know, in the two directions, obviously different configuration of cues. And it's sort of a, you know, one simple challenge to that idea that is, oh yeah, it's just the, you know, it's the configuration, distinct, you know, visually polarized configuration cues, well, you just turn off the lights. If you turn off the lights when an animal's doing this task, you know what happens to these place fields? Almost nothing. It's like, still, they still fire, same location, same, everything's the same. You don't, you definitely don't need visual cues in order for these cells to fire. 
The other thing which is interesting is so you can do this if I take this maze, in this case, and I just have like a track that goes up, like a really strong U-shaped track, what you find is there will be place cells that are directional, but now it's for the turn direction, right? They'll fire when you go around, around this curve, this turn, this way, right? Counterclockwise and not clockwise. Now, that sort of challenges the, you know, the view hypothesis at all, you know, uh, and the idea of specific configurations of cues as driving it, because in the one case, I'm seeing all the cues, I'm seeing both directions, right? I'm just seeing them in a different order, this way or this way, <laughs> you know, when I go around this way, and then this way, this way, it's the, it's the same, it's, you know, it's basically the same cues. It's not one set of cues, it's not one view. Both views are actually part of both trajectories. And the difference is, it's this, you know, the clockwise, counterclockwise. So it's like, yeah, you know, it can't be some like static property. It really does have to be something about the time sequence. It's something about the time sequence that, you know, must be relevant. 100%, and all of these things will be used. Uh, and just a little, yeah, just a little side note. So, you know, rodents kind of get short shrift when it comes to this idea. It's like, oh, yeah, mice, rats, they're blind. You know, I like primates, primates, you know. Uh, uh, and, for, you know, for rodents, it's all about smell, right? Smell first, you know, touch, you know, somatosensory second, then vision is like way down there. When you actually do the psychophysical experiments and then you put them in environments where they, you pit visual, you know, olfactory and somatosensory information, much like primates, vision is actually a it's, a, it's a dominant sense. So they use vision over other cues if it's available. The difference is it, they, don't, they don't require that. And, and also the nature of visual information, indeed, for like sort of distal cues, you know, the vision is relatively low acuity. But for very proximal cues, in fact, cues in which you can combine like verbrissal, you know, tactile and visual information, they can do very high acuity proximal object recognition, just like, you know, just like primates. It's just that you have to put everything, you gotta put everything very close. And, you know, maybe when we get to it, I'll, I'll talk about these experiments. I actually recording in the visual cortex where we found, it was very much like, you know, the, the sort of the primate-centric view. When you record the visual cortex, you put a, you know, rodent in a large room with distal cues, you know, relatively, you know, uh, impoverished environment, you find visual responses are terrible. Very few cells fire, they're not really strongly, you know, uh, um, kind of cue dependent. But if you make one small change, and that is instead of putting the cues out on the wall, you put the cues down on the floor and close to them, right? Proximal visual cues, now all of a sudden, now you get most of the cells fire, they're very selective, and you get all the, uh, you know, I'll talk about like the reactivation during sleep. So you get the real visual code for rodents is something that is, you know, tied to the thing that's most ecologically relevant to them, and that's, you know, it's proximal cues, because that's where their world is. Primates, yes, they rely more on high acuity distal information, but it's not a vision thing. It's not like rats are not blind, basically, that's it, right? They're, uh, and so if the visual cues are available, they would use them. But here, it's just the time sequence information. You can turn the lights off, and they will use, you know, even in the absence of all of these cues, olfactory, you know, uh, somatosensory, visual, they can still do this using the integration of self-motion information, or so-called idiothetic information. And that idiothetic or self-motion information can include vestibular information. They can, you know, detect linear and angular, you know, uh, sort of accelerations. Uh, it can also include like motor efference. They can keep track of like their footfalls, the kind of strategies that insects use. For instance, they don't have a insects don't have a you know in, you know inner ear, no vestibular system, but they can keep track of you know uh, of uh, you know heading and uh, and distance by counting footfalls. Rodents will do the same thing, and so. Uh, which is why you can have, for instance, you put a rat in a running wheel and you still see play cells. And, and it's like, oh, they're not moving, but they're still running. And so they can use that, the motor efference, uh, you know, together. And all together, that has sort of, has, you know, argued that the hippocampal system, the spatial representation, can be sufficiently driven by what's referred to as the path integration system. That they're using a, a sort of a system for, and like computing spatial location by integrating motion signals to figure out where they are, and that's how you build the map through path integration. Yeah, it's a you know little little 
uh, segue. But uh, so I, I was, uh, yeah, I was wondering whether anybody would, would would jump on the running wheel. So the, like these, there were these running wheel experiments that were that were really designed initially to to challenge the idea that the representation of the hippocampus was purely spatial, and the argument being. Well, you put an animal on a running wheel and they're not moving, their location's not changing. So if there's any non-stationary, the hippocampal representation can't be space, right? And so when you do this, uh, uh, initially, like Yuri Busaki found this, and you know, Howard Eichenbaum followed with it, this idea that, that cells in the hippocampus seem to be able to produce non-stationary responses that are more correlated with time elapsed than elapsed location. Okay, and so they referred to these cells as time cells rather than place cells. And this is like there's a whole history going back from, right from the beginning of, you know, sort of O'Keeffe's discovery, sort of the challenge of the notion that the hippocampus is primarily, or some would argue, exclusively involved in representing space, the so-called non-spatial hypothesis. Like, yeah, no, the hippocampus, there's nothing special about space. Space just happens to be the thing that is always there, and so of course you always see it. So there's a great effort to devise experiments which took space out, animals doing things without spatial correlates. And you know, the short takeaway from that experiment is that like three decades more, or up to like five decades of research, um, have only really strengthened the argument that there is something fundamental about space. It's never, it was never the case that O'Keefe argued that it's space and only space. His argument really was that there was something special about space, that whatever else you inclu include in the hippocampal representation, space is always there. And that largely has been the, let's say, the conclusion from most of the experiments designed to try to, you know, uh, 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 remove space as a, as a sort of a relevant correlate, and that is you don't need space, so a task that don't need space, and yet the hippocampus still encodes it. So that's, you know, uh, to me suggests, yes, there is something special about space. And what would that, you know, why would space be, space be special, I think is an interesting question. Now, of course, there are many other functions that, you, that the hippocampus has been tied to that don't seem obviously spatial. A lot of interest, for instance, social cognition. Social cognition is something that, uh, you know, you could argue and has been argued, well, that's like a CA2 thing. CA2 might be, you know, more specifically involved in social cognition. It's elaborating humans. It doesn't involve space, and yet, uh, in different parts of the hippocampus. Everything I've talked about right now, there's this long axis of the hippocampus, the so-called dorsal and ventral axis in the rodents, or anterior posterior in humans. So the hippocampus in humans is kind of, yeah, you know, as you evolve and you get lazy, the hippocampus kind of slides down because, you know, it's kind of... And so what's dorsal in the rodent is posterior in humans. So in the human literature talking about anterior hippocampus is really in the rodent literature you would talk about as ventral hippocampus. That's the, and ventral hippocampus has a different kind of connectivity. It connects the prefrontal cortex. It's been associated with like emotional learning and you know, social, you know, sort of social cognition. And yet when you look in, in the ventral hippocampus, you still find place cells. The place representation is still there. It's different. Place fields tend to be larger. They may have certain kind of symmetries, but place is still there. So that was always the O'Keefe argument. Whatever else is in, being encoded, place is there. Now, why would place still be there? Why would you use, let's see, uh, the idea of place, and again, I kind of come back to this notion of a path integrator. So a, a path integrator is largely, I, I construct simple equation of motion. It's, my, it's the x dot, x dot idea, right? If I have x dot, some, something that's changing as a function of time, state changing as a function of time, I can integrate that to get my state. Space is an obvious one. The x dot is just, again, it's like self idiothetic self-motion information. But x dot, x can be anything. It doesn't have to be space, right? And so it's the idea that path integration, the path can be a path in, in you know, literal space and semantic space and social space. And so it's the idea of using, of the, you know, the hippocampus using this derivative information. It's representing change in state in some way. And then you use the same principle, the same principles that work in space to do path integration. So the path integrator works in space. You can generalize to anything else where you have an x dot. And so that's the, and it kind of comes back to this, well, 
we'll see where, we'll see if we get and this idea of of uh, of utilizing gradient information and in particular uh, the inputs to the hippocampus reflecting gradients or these you know like x dots being able to compute the derivative of those things being kind of fundamental to the computation that the hippocampus is going to perform to try to keep track of time sequence information could be a sequence of locations could be a sequence of you know of words or letters could be a sort of a sequence of social interactions so it could be a sequence but you need the x dot and the, you know the nature of the of the representation that can exploit that is the will be the common you know sort of be the common property that's the and so that's really the that's the argument so you know i tend not to get too bogged down in this is it space is it not space is it you know uh, uh, and then the idea of time or time cells, clearly time is the critical, is the one common thing. That's why in the opening slide, the slide one that I actually got to, that was the argument. It really is, you know, it's the, it's the encoding of temporal information. How is that done? So I posit it's like time sequence information, but I think more fundamentally it really is this sort of X dot time bearing, time bearing state. 